Good afternoon. We have previously noted our strong concerns regarding Russian disinformation and the likelihood that Moscow might create, seek to create, a false flag operation to initiate military activity. Now we can say that the United States has information that Russia is planning to stage fabricated attacks by Ukrainian military or intelligence forces as a pretext for a further invasion of Ukraine. One possible option the Russians are considering, and which we made public today, involves the production of a propaganda video, a video with graphic scenes of false explosions depicting cor corpses, crisis actors to pretending to be mourners, and images of destroyed locations or military equipment, entirely fabrica fabricated by Russian intelligence. To be clear, the production of this propaganda video is one of a number of options that the Russian government is developing as a fake pretext to initiate and potentially justify military aggression against Ukraine. We don't know if Russia will necessarily use this or another option in the coming days. We are publicizing it now, however, in order to lay bare the extent of Russia's destabilizing actions towards Ukraine and to dissuade Russia from continuing this dangerous campaign and ultimately launching a military attack. Russia has signaled it's willing to continue diplomatic talks as a means to de-escalate, but actions such as these suggest otherwise. We will continue to diligently work together with our allies and partners to expose Russian disinformation and other hybrid tactics used against Ukraine. We continue to work to prevent any effort Moscow might make to justify further military action in Ukraine. We again urge Russia to stop its destructive and destabilizing disinformation campaign, to de-escalate tensions, and to engage in diplomacy and dialogue for a peaceful solution. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, OK, well, that's a, quite a mouthful there. Um, so you said actions such as these suggest otherwise, suggest meaning they, they suggest they're not interested in talks and they're going to go ahead with some kind of a, what action are you talking about? One, the actions I've just pointed to. Uh, the what fact, action? What? The, the fact that Russia continues to engage uh, in disinformation well, uh, campaigns. You, know, you made an allegation that they might do that. Have they actually done it? Uh, what we know, Matt, is what we what I have just said that they have engaged in this activity, well, uh, in this planning well, activity. But, activity. But let me let me because because obviously this is not this is not the first time we've made uh, these reports public. You'll remember that just a few well, weeks I, ago. I'm sorry, you, made, made, made what report public? If you'll let me finish, I will okay. tell you what report we made okay. public. Uh, we told you a few weeks ago that we have information indicating Russia also has already prepositioned a group of operatives to conduct a false flag operation in eastern Ukraine. So that, Matt, to your question, is an action that Russia has already well, taken. It's an action that you say that they have taken, but you have shown no evidence to, 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 to confirm that. And I'm going to get to the next question here, which is, what is the evidence that they, I mean, this is like crisis actors, really? This is like Alex Jones territory you're getting into now. Um, what evidence do you have to support the idea that there is some propaganda film in the, in, in the making? Matt, this is derived uh, from information known to the U.S. government, intelligence information that we have declassified. I think you well, know. Okay, well, where, where is it? Where, where is this information? It is intelligence information that we have declassified. Well, where is it? Where is the declassified information? I just delivered it. But, no, you made a series of allegations and would statements. You, would you like us to print it out the topper? Because you will see a transcript of this briefing that you can print out for but yourself. That's not evidence, Ned. That's you saying it. That's not evidence. I'm sorry. What would you like, Matt? I, I would like to see some proof that you that 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 that, that you can show that that Matt, you have that, been that, that shows you, that 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 you, shows that the Russians are doing this. Ned, I've been doing this for. A I long know that time. was my point. As, you as, you as have you, know. you you have been doing this for quite a while. You know I that have. when we declassify intelligence That's information, right. and I we do so in, in a means. In we do and so. I, and, we do so with an eye to that, protecting that sources and methods. Is not going to fall. I, I remember a lot of things. So where, where, where is the declassified information other than you coming out here and saying? 
Matt, I'm sorry you don't like the format, uh, but we have it's declassified. It's not the format, it's the content. I'm it's... sorry you don't like the content. I'm sorry it's you, I'm sorry like you are doubting just... the information that is in the possession of the U.S. government. No, I... I, what I'm telling you is that this is information that's available to us. We are making it available to you uh, in order uh, for a couple reasons. One is to attempt to deter the Russians from going ahead with this activity. Two, in the event we're not able to do that, in the event the Russians do go ahead with this, to make it clear as day, to lay bare the fact that this has always been an attempt on the part of the Russian Federation to fabricate a pretext. Yeah, but you don't have any, any evidence to back it up other than what you're saying. It's like you're saying, we think we, we, we have information that the Russians may do this. But you won't tell us what the information well, is. That, and then when, when, that, when you're that, asked... That, that is the idea behind when, deterrence, Matt. When, when, that is the idea behind asked, deterrence. And when it is asked, our hope that the Russians don't go forward with this. And when you what the information is, you say, I just gave it to you. But that, that's not what... You, you seem not to not understand, you seem not to no, understand no, no, the idea of deterrence. <laughs> we are trying to not deter the Russians from moving forward with this type of activity. That is why we're making it public today. If the Russians don't go forward with this, that is not... Uh, ipso facto, an indication that they never had plans to do so. Uh, but then it's unprovable. <laughs> I mean, my God, what is the evidence that you have that suggests that, that, that the Russians are even planning this? Matt, you, I mean, I'm not you, saying that they're not, but you just come out and say this and expect us just to, to, to believe it without you showing a shred of evidence that it's actually true. Other than when I ask, or when anyone else asked, what's the information? You said, well, I just gave it to you, which was just you making a statement. Matt, you said yourself, you've been in this business for quite a long time. You know that when we make information, uh, intelligence information public, we do so uh, in, a, in a way that protects sensitive sources and methods. You also know that we do so, we declassify information only when we're confident in that information. Yeah, you if you doubt, if you doubt the, the credibility of the US government, of the British government, uh, of other governments and want to uh, you know, find uh, solace and in information that uh, the Russians solace? are putting out. Uh, that is uh, <laughs> that is for to, you to do. I'm not asking what, what the Russian government is putting out. And, and what, do you mean, what is it supposed to be? US officials are describing uh, very specific scenes, but do they actually have a video? The, the fact that we are able to go into such great detail, uh, obviously I'm not going to spell out what is in our possession, but I will leave, uh, I will leave it to you. Uh, I will leave that to your, uh, to your judgment, there, your imagination. There are no facts that you've spelled out. Coming days. Do you have evidence that this was intended to come out in the coming days? We've, we've said, Ben, for some time now that the Russians uh, have position forces, uh, they have undertaken preparations, that if Putin decides to move forward with an invasion, uh, they're positioned to do so. You they are poised to do so. In the coming days, I mean, was, is that a timeline that you felt that this was going to happen imminently? Well, we, we know what they are planning for. We know the contingencies uh, that uh, they have engaged in. Uh, and again, these are the kinds of steps uh, that they are poised to undertake if that decision is made. And Our goal in all of this uh, is to deter an invasion, to deter uh, this type uh, of activity. Uh, so we certainly hope it doesn't take place. We are making clear what we know so that in the event it does take place, uh, it will be clear to the world uh, what this actually was and what it was not. And the pre-positioned teams, uh, when do you uh, suggest they were pre-positioned? Are we going back months? I mean, or is this a more recent sort of deployment? Well, this was something that we made public several weeks ago now. Uh, so several weeks ago, we said that uh, information available to us indicated that Russia had already prepositioned a group of operatives to conduct a false flag operation in eastern Ukraine. Was it uh, recent at that point? Because if they had come across just a few weeks ago, that would be a, a Russian aggression across the border, which you've warned time and time again would result in you know, severe consequences. Ben, you know that the sort of hybrid activity that we've been pointing to, uh, much of it has been going on since 2014. Obviously, we're very attuned uh, to any uh, Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine that uh, may take place in this atmosphere, given the uh, heightened tensions. Intentions, Andrea. Can you, in any case, in any way, describe your level of confidence at which you have not suggested, at how far along in the planning this is? You know, at some level of planning in terms of their possible operations. The facts, Andrea, that um, we are able to go into such detail, uh, the fact that we are able to do that uh, with 
uh, 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 with confidence, because we would not be saying this otherwise, uh, suggests that uh, this is something that uh, is this planning, uh, at least this contingency planning, is well underway. Uh, we wouldn't be making this information public uh, were we not confident in the underlying details uh, and confident in the allegations that we put forward. Is this, is this in any way connected to the previous report, as another phase of the previous report? Uh, the previous report, excuse me, that the British put out that was then confirmed to have come originally from American sourcing. Uh, this is all part of, part and parcel of a broader effort. I'm not going to speak to uh, how various streams of uh, intelligence, now declassified information, may or may not stitch together. Uh, but what we know uh, is that uh, Russian military and intelligence entities uh, for some time now uh, have been engaged in this type of activity. Uh, we know uh, that it was a very similar set of tactics uh, that they undertook in 2014 uh, as a means by which to fabricate uh, a pretext uh, for the invasion that took place uh, some eight years ago. Uh, so that is part of, uh, that certainly is part of the concern. Uh, the other uh, element of the concern is not only the historical aspect of it, the fact that uh, we have seen this before, uh, but the fact of what we are seeing now, uh, what we are uh, picking up now uh, through uh, means that, of course, we can't get into, um, but that has produced information available to us in which we are confident. Uh, we know that Similarly, that Russian military and intelligence entities are engaged in a, in a broad uh, disinformation uh, and propaganda effort. Uh, this includes malign social media operations, uh, the use of overt and covert online proxy media outlets, the injection of disinformation in television and radio programming, uh, hosting of conferences designed to influence attendees into falsely believing that Ukraine, not Russia, is at fault for heightened tensions in the region, the leveraging of cyber operations to deface media outlets and conduct uh, what are known as hack and release operations. To give you one example, uh, we know that the Russia's, uh, that Russia's uh, Federal Security Service, or the FSB, directly tasks and influences proxy media outlets, uh, for example, Newsfront, uh, to publish content that denigrates Ukraine, Ukraine and falsely depicts it as the aggressor. Uh, articles written by this and other outlets, uh, as a result, have made their way not only to uh, pro-Kremlin proxy outlets, but also official Russian state media outlets uh, like Ria Novosti uh, and others. Uh, you know that the other week uh, we put out a great deal of information on uh, Russia's uh, disinformation and propaganda efforts. This has been long running, uh, but we also know that uh, this type of activity has accelerated in recent weeks, which uh, further fuels our concern. Uh, to give you just one example, uh, l during December, a couple months ago, Russian language content on social media covering the narratives that we've talked about, uh, <laughs> the lie that Ukraine is the aggressor, aggressor uh, the, the lie that uh, it is Russia that is being threatened, uh, increased to an average of nearly 3,500 posts per day. That was a 200% increase uh, from the daily average just the month before. Uh, and it was the month before uh, that we had seen uh, a similarly large spike. Uh, so we are quite concerned by all of this. Uh, we're concerned by the specifics, but we're also concerned by the broader trends uh, that to us are reminiscent in many ways, many disturbing ways, of what we saw in 2014 uh, and what we fear we may be seeing uh, a, uh, a, a replay of now. With all of the diplomacy that is underway, uh, Macron and others, as well as what the Secretary may be doing with, with Foreign Minister Lavrov, do you see a longer timeline? Because the White House notably did not use the word imminent in terms of an invasion. Has that perspective changed at all? So I, I think there's been some confusion around this, because we've always been consistent <laughs> that, uh, insofar as we know, Vladimir Putin has not made a final decision. Uh, so until and unless he makes a final decision to invade, uh, this will not be imminent. What we do know and what our concern is, is that Russia has undertaken these steps, including the amassing of 100,000 forces along Ukraine's borders, uh, the dispatch 
of thousands of troops, up to 30,000 forces, uh, into what should be the sovereign, independent country uh, of Belarus, uh, undertaking this sort of disinformation and propaganda uh, activity. All of this puts Moscow in a position to be able to move swiftly in a very aggressive way against Ukraine if it so choose. That has always been our position, or at least I should say that has been our position in recent weeks as all of these ingredients have come together. Simon. Uh, yeah, also in Russia, um, the Russian foreign minister met with uh, his Chinese counterpart um, and China expressed understanding and support for Russia's position um, regarding the US and NATO. Uh, they're, they're talking about uh, coordinated positions between China and Russia. You know, is this concerning to you that there, that there is this kind of uh, new alliance seeming to be forming in opposition to, uh, to, to U.S. policy interests around the world? I, I'd make uh, two points. Um, first, and this is something we discussed uh, a few days ago, but Secretary Blinken had an opportunity to speak to Foreign Minister Wong of the PRC uh, last week. And as part of that conversation, uh, the Secretary and the Foreign Minister discussed uh, the tensions that are result, the result of uh, Moscow's uh, needless provocations and military buildup, um, and the potential implications uh, of a Russian incursion or invasion into Ukraine. Uh, this is an eventuality that poses risks not only to Ukraine, to uh, Europe, to the United States, uh, but well beyond that, uh, including to uh, the PRC. Uh, the global security and economic risks posed by uh, further Russian aggression uh, would be enormous, uh, and they would have consequences not only on Ukraine, Europe, the transatlantic community, uh, but on the PRC uh, as well. The second point, uh, it gets to some of the measures we're taking uh, in an effort to deter uh, what could be uh, additional Russian aggression. And that's the economic and financial consequences uh, that we have said would befall the Russian Federation if there uh, were, uh, if this uh, was to go forward. Uh, similarly, those would be massive uh, on uh, the Kremlin. Uh, if Russia uh, thinks that it will be in a position to make up uh, some of those consequences, to mitigate uh, some of those consequences by a closer relationship uh, with the PRC, uh, that is uh, not the case. Uh, it will actually make the Russian economy in, win in many ways uh, more brittle. If you look at, for example, uh, where the major inputs to foundational technologies come from, they still come from the West. Uh, if you deny yourself uh, the ability to transact with the West, to import uh, with the West from Europe, uh, from the United States, uh, you are going to significantly degrade your productive capacity uh, and your innovative potential. Putin knows uh, that this would be of massive consequence uh, to his country uh, and to his uh, economy. Uh, this a closer relationship with the PRC, a closer relationship between Russia and the PRC, uh, is not going to make up for that. Uh, it is not going uh, to account for that. Uh, one final point. We have, and when I say we, I mean collectively, the United States and our, our allies and partners, uh, we have an array of tools uh, that we can deploy. If we see foreign companies, including those in China, uh, doing their best to backfill U.S. export control actions, uh, to evade them, uh, to um, uh, get around them. Uh, I wouldn't want to speculate on uh, what those tools are, but we do have tools uh, that can address that, and that would seek to account for that. But you said uh, uh, a closer relationship with China would actually make their position, Russia's position more brittle. How, how would it do that? It, because it would make uh, the Russian economy uh, dependent uh, on one economy, or much more dependent uh, on uh, one economy. Uh, this is uh, a recipe for uh, catastrophe for the Russian economy. Uh, if Putin thinks uh, that the measures we've talked about uh, won't have the bite, uh, won't have uh, the consequences that we've warned about, uh, and no partnership uh, can account for uh, the massive economic toll uh, 
uh, that we've talked about, given the financial tools that are available to us, the sanctions tools that are available to us, uh, and the export control actions, among others, uh, that we're in a position to take. But you said uh, Secretary Blinken spoke to, to Foreign Minister Wang and tried to make this case, but it sounds like from what they've said today, they, you know, they've not taken that on board. You know, do you, are, you, are you concerned that the, the, the Chinese don't agree with what you're arguing here? I, I would leave it to the PRC to characterize their position. I think what you have heard publicly from the PRC, uh, including in the context of uh, the UN uh, earlier this week, uh, is that the PRC, like us, like just about every other country around the world, uh, would prefer to see uh, a diplomatic solution uh, to the crisis that Russia had need, has needlessly sure. provoked. Yeah, before we leave the Ukraine, I'm curious, when was the last time the Secretary spoke to uh, the Foreign Minister, his the Ukrainian Foreign Minister? To yeah. the Ukrainian Foreign Minister, it has been, uh, he spoke to him just after we left uh, Geneva. Uh, that was 10 days ago. Okay, but not since the, uh, this, not this week, in other words. I'm not uh, aware of a call this week, but uh, we do regularly engage with uh, our Ukrainian counterparts. All right, and then, and then one, just one, one last thing. Like, I, I, I'm not buying into Russian propaganda, but I'm also not going to buy into an, I'm not accusa asking you an to accusation. Yes, you are. You're saying the proof is that I just said it. So let me just appeal to you on behalf of all of us in the American people and the people of the world and the Russian people and the Ukrainian people. One piece of evidence to suggest that the Russians are planning to use crisis actors to stage a false mass casualty event to use as a pretext. Just one piece, okay? And not you or Kirby or Jen or John Finer or Jake saying this is what is so. And then you turning around and saying, well, because we said it, it's a fact. So let me one let, piece of let me one make, piece of verifiable evidence. Let, let me make let me make a, a couple broad points. And I I I acknowledge this will probably unset, be unsatisfactory to you in the moment. Uh, but uh, here's what I think you know, uh, what I certainly know, uh, what everyone here knows. There are 100,000 Russian troops encircling Ukraine right now, uh, approaching Ukraine's borders, close to the borders. There are thousands of Russian troops uh, with the potential for some 30,000 Russian troops to stream in to Belarus. Uh, all of these forces are positioned, could well be positioned if Putin makes that decision. Uh, to uh, engage on Ukraine in a coordinated assault. Uh, we also know uh, that the Russians have resorted to these tactics in the past, uh, have uh, developed a remarkably similar playbook in 2014, amassed troops, uh, engaged in 2014, it is a historical fact, uh, engaged in disinformation and propaganda to paint Ukraine as the aggressor, uh, fabricated a pretext for an invasion and went in. So with what we know from eight years ago, with what we have seen, you and I both have seen, everyone has seen, with what we have heard eight years ago, in the ensuing eight years, uh, and in recent weeks, um, it seems to me that uh, it should not be outlandish uh, that the Russians may be uh, engaging well, in this okay, activity fine, but not again. being outlandish doesn't mean that you have any proof that it's, that it's happening the second point, or being the second planned. Point, the Hold second on, point. Ned, you can't just, all of that may very well be true, probably is true, okay? But it doesn't provide any evidence of what you're alleging now, which is that they're planning this mass, fake mass casualty event with quote unquote crisis actors, which is something that, you know, in the U.S., we rarely hear outside of the kind of, you know, nutty conspiracy theory um, uh, crowd. Well, to be, to be clear, we're not alleging what the United States is doing. Uh, this is information available to us, no, no, what the Russians are up to. I understand your point, but I just want to... Uh, you do? Because, I mean, uh, you're treading into serious waters here. And, 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 and if you can't provide any evidence other than, well, I said so, and so it's a fact, that's a problem. Matt, there's a second point. Uh, this is derived from intelligence. Intelligence in which uh, we well, have confidence, we, in which we have confidence. The otherwise, same confidence you had in, in, otherwise, in WMD uh, otherwise, in otherwise, mean, what, what? otherwise, we would not be making it public in the way we are. Uh, but here's, here's the other point. Um, intelligence and evidence, uh, these are two separate things. 
Uh, it is uh, yeah, no. But you're, but you're saying it's a fact, and that, it, that you have proof, and then you can't offer any proof, and to to, to show that it's fact, I'll drop it. But I think we Thank should you. move on. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I, you said that you have measures uh, in case companies from from China and elsewhere try to backfill uh, Russian orders. Uh, I mean, can you offer any more detail on what that would mean? And has the secretary uh, expressed that uh, that possibility to Foreign Minister Wang or others in the PRC? Uh, in the conversation uh, the other day with uh, his PRC counterpart, there was uh, an extended discussion uh, of the potential implications of Russian aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, we have been. Um, without speaking to that conversation specifically, we haven't been shy uh, as well in speaking to the potential implications uh, of the measures that uh, we and our allies are prepared to enact if Russia uh, does uh, move forward with a further invasion uh, of Ukraine. Uh, so whether it's the PRC, uh, whether it is uh, an economy in Europe, whether it's any country uh, around the world, uh, the implications of that uh, are, are pretty clear. Uh, those allies and partners that are working with us directly on this package of uh, sanctions and other economic measures, uh, they certainly have uh, a deeper level of insight. Uh, but even countries uh, that are uh, not as engaged in this uh, have a, a good idea uh, based on what we've said publicly and the information uh, that in many instances we've conveyed privately. I can just um, follow up on the, on the question of the video. You know, first of all, what does what does the existence of this level of operational planning mean for the prospects of diplomacy going forward? And is the US considering and, and has it threatened any form of retaliatory information operations of its own against Russia? What it means uh, in terms of diplomacy uh, is uh, uh, for us, the door to diplomacy remains open. Uh, this is contingency planning uh, that the Russians are undertaking. Uh, we know what, at least uh, we assess, what um, Putin and the Russian Federation uh, are seeking here is optionality. Uh, and we've consistently said uh, that uh, we have no information to indicate that Putin has made a final decision to invade uh, or not to invade. Uh, so until uh, that decision is made, uh, until uh, Russian aggression uh, goes forward, uh, for us, the door for diplomacy <clears throat> remains open. We still want to be able to find a, a resolution to this through diplomacy and dialogue. That doesn't mean that we're not simultaneously moving down the path of defense and deterrence. Uh, we absolutely are. Just as uh, the Russians are giving themselves optionality, uh, we too are lending ourselves a degree of optionality uh, by ensuring that whichever path Putin chooses, the path of uh, aggression or the path of diplomacy, uh, that we too will be ready. And, and would information operations be part of that optionality? Uh, look, I'm not going to uh, speak to that. I think as a general matter, uh, we have made the point uh, that the best antidote to disinformation, the best antidote to information, to, to propaganda, is information. Uh, that is precisely why uh, you have heard us not only today, but with uh, the previous uh, 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 previous uh, elements we have declassified and put forward, uh, we have sought to do a couple things to deter the Russians from uh, taking these courses, from pursuing these paths, uh, but also, again, in the event uh, they choose the path of aggression and invasion, uh, to lay bare that this was the plan uh, all along. So I think when uh, you look at what we're doing, uh, we are using uh, information uh, to combat uh, the disinformation, the propaganda, that we're seeing emanate from Moscow. Andrea. Can you tell us uh, more about the initiative at NATO that Ann Neuberger is reading, leading t with our allies to better defend against a uh, cyber attack? So this is, I, I will in the first instance leave it to uh, colleagues at the White House uh, and the Department of Homeland Security to uh, speak about uh, those efforts. But this is part and parcel of our efforts to be prepared for any contingency uh, that arises. Uh, you've heard us speak to this uh, broadly in terms of our preference for diplomacy and dialogue, uh, the uh, defensive and deterrent moves 
uh, that we are taking, uh, whether it is providing uh, defensive security assistance to the Ukrainians, uh, whether it is uh, reinforcing uh, our NATO allies on the eastern flank, whether it is engaging with conversations uh, with partners and allies around the world uh, on energy supplies uh, to mitigate the potential uh, implications uh, in energy markets, uh, but also when it comes to cyber, uh, because we know that, again, uh, the Russians have a long playbook. It is a playbook with uh, many options in it. It's a playbook uh, that uh, they have turned to in the past to resort to a variety of tactics. Uh, we know that cyber has been uh, one of those tactics. They've deployed it uh, against Ukraine. They've deployed it uh, against uh, countries um, much further afield, including the United States. Uh, so it is only prudent for us to be prepared for an eventuality in which the Russians uh, once again reach for this tactic. Our goal, again, in all of this is to deter this. Our goal, again, in all of this is to see to it uh, that uh, these actions uh, don't emerge from the Russian Federation. But if they do, uh, we are going to extraordinary lengths to be prepared. But in terms of uh, shoring up defenses, uh, is there a, an initiative to reach out to American businesses so that if there is malware, it doesn't quickly move through the supply chain? I mean. I, I will allow the White House and DHS and, and CISA and others to speak to this, but uh, public-private partnership is really at the heart uh, of our efforts uh, to defend, to harden networks uh, against uh, cyber attacks. We know that this is something that the federal government alone cannot do. Uh, we have known that for uh, some time. Uh, I think if you speak to my uh, colleagues uh, in these other departments and agencies, you will hear a great emphasis on the role of public-private partnerships. Yes. Just one more about the video. Um, when did you get this intelligence? Is this brand new, uh, or, or is this something that you've known about for some time? Uh, again, I think this comes in the context of the escalating tensions. This comes in the context of our concerns uh, for potential renewed since Russian. Since the last announcement uh, of the false flag operation, is it, is it since then? So I'm again, I'm not in a position to uh, offer additional detail on what is still uh, intelligence-derived information. What I can say is that. Uh, this information was acquired in the context of the escalating tensions, uh, and that is uh, a cause of our uh, uh, profound and growing concern. Yes, sir. Uh, let me change the subject to uh, uh, Yemen. Today, uh, Senate Minority Leader uh, Mitch McConnell said that he asked Biden administration to put more pressure on Houthis to stop the uh, next attack. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of this pressure, you have talked about uh, sanctioning top leaders, Houthi top leaders, and then uh, you said that the uh, Biden administration is reconsidering redesignating the uh, group as a terrorist group. Uh, can you update us on both aspects of this? And uh, also, if that possible, to connect that to what has been happening in Vienna, because he pinpointed that Iran basically is responsible for the latest two ballistic missiles were launched to uh, Abu Dhabi. Uh, so in terms of the Houthis, uh, I don't have an update for you in terms of uh, the um, review of their status. Uh, as you know, the president uh, in his press conference last month uh, said that the decision was uh, under consideration. Uh, obviously, I don't want to get ahead of those uh, of any such policy uh, deliberations. Nevertheless, that doesn't stop us uh, from holding Houthi leaders accountable for these types of attacks. Uh, and we're not going to relent uh, in using uh, all appropriate tools, including uh, sanctions and designations, uh, of Houthi leaders and of entities who are involved in military offensives uh, that are threatening civilians and regional stability, that perpetuate the conflict uh, against those who commit human rights abuses or violate international humanitarian law, uh, or those who exacerbate uh, the humanitarian crisis or uh, seek to profit uh, from the suffering of the many people. And we know that there are Houthi leaders who have done precisely uh, those things. Uh, we have held uh, uh, many such Houthi leaders to account using these authorities. Uh, and again, we're not going to relent uh, in doing so. At the same time, uh, we do remain committed uh, to doing all we can, as effectively as we can, to address the humanitarian emergency that continues to afflict Yemen. Uh, this is a country uh, where uh, according to most estimates and many analyses, uh, the site of the world's uh, largest humanitarian catastrophe. More than 16 million Yemenis uh, are suffering from food insecurity. 
Uh, and so uh, as we seek to engage in diplomacy to bring about uh, an end to uh, the civil war, because we know a diplomatic uh, resolution to the civil war will uh, be the best antidote to the levels of instability, uh, levels of violence, uh, the humanitarian catastrophe, uh, we are continuing uh, to do all we can in the interim uh, to provide uh, uh, and to encourage the world uh, to raise its ambition to provide uh, for the long-suffering uh, Yemeni people. Uh, what's going on in Vienna uh, is squarely focused on one thing and one thing only, uh, and that is uh, Iran's nuclear program. Uh, Iran, as you know, poses a range of challenges uh, to the United States, uh, to our partners uh, and allies uh, in the region and beyond. Um, one of those challenges uh, is its provision uh, and its support uh, for proxies, for terrorist groups, uh, for other destabilizing actors uh, in the region, including the Houthis. Uh, and so uh, we are focused on that. We are focused on that using a number of tools. What we're focused on in Vienna uh, is bringing about, uh, once again, seeing if we can bring about, once again, uh, a nuclear deal that imposes permanent and verifiable limits uh, on Iran's nuclear program and that verifiably prevents Iran from obtaining a nuclear weapon. Yes. Um, just staying on Yemen for a second. I mean, it's been about, I guess, four months now, correct me if I'm wrong, that uh, there's been U.S. employees, although they are local, but U.S. employees detained by the Houthis. Uh, this morning, Special Envoy uh, Lender King mentioned that there were five former uh, employees, but then he said there are employees. We, we haven't had any really clarity on how many are detained, what's the status on that. Um, I mean, it sends a pretty strong signal to anybody that, you know, would like to work for a U.S. embassy abroad that it's been almost four months and, you know, the U.S. hasn't been able to get these guys and girls out. What should also send a very strong signal uh, is that uh, we have been and we will be unceasing in our efforts uh, to... Uh, secure the release of our Yemeni staff uh, in Sana'a. Uh, as you heard from uh, the Special Envoy, uh, there are several uh, who remain detained, uh, and we are uh, going to continue to be unceasing, unrelenting uh, in our diplomatic efforts uh, to see them uh, released. Uh, you mentioned Special Envoy Linder King on NPR this morning. Uh, he also noted the fact uh, that um, the fact that the Houthis uh, continue to hold these individuals, uh, local, uh, uh, our local Yemeni staff, as well as uh, UN local staff, uh, it is an indication to us that uh, the Yemenis, that the Houthis, excuse me, uh, haven't quite made the determination uh, to uh, make peace. Uh, they have not quite made the determination uh, to uh, the path of diplomacy. Uh, that is what we are going to continue to press for, uh, to press for a diplomatic path, a diplomatic uh, resolution to this, uh, knowing that the levels of violence, the levels of instability, uh, the humanitarian catastrophe, all of that uh, is fueled by uh, the ongoing civil war, which we are committed in working with the UN Special Envoy, uh, with our partners in the region, uh, and others uh, to seeing come to an end. How many? How many... Stat, how many U.S. employees are, are being detained right now? We've, we've made reference to several. I just uh, don't have additional detail to share. Yes. I have a question from Bloomberg. Sure. Okay. Um, so last month you said that you have a number of uh, tools in your arsenal. Uh, I assume that pushing for additional sanctions at the Security Council um, was one of the tools you had. Uh, but, you know, as we know, uh, that attempt was blocked by uh, Russia and China. So uh, what uh, other tools do you have? Um, also, uh, there will be a meeting uh, tomorrow at the Security Council on North Korea. So uh, what do you expect to achieve? Uh, and I have another one, but I'll let you answer. So in terms of uh, tools, you raised the uh, uh, specific tool of our sanctions authority. Uh, last month uh, in January, uh, we imposed sanctions on eight DPRK-linked individuals and entities uh, for supporting the DPRK's weapons of mass destruction uh, and ballistic missile-related programs. Uh, we are uh, continuing and we have continued to be in touch uh, with our allies uh, and partners on, uh, uh, as well as the UN, on further steps uh, that can be taken. I think you know that uh, Special Representative Kim uh, has recently engaged uh, his uh, Japanese and ROK uh, counterparts uh, on this very uh, question. Uh, Linda Thomas-Greenfield, our ambassador to the UN, you've heard uh, from her that she is deeply engaged 
uh, on the challenge and the threat to international uh, peace and security that the DPRK poses uh, in New York at the UN. Uh, but all the while, uh, another important tool uh, is our diplomatic efforts. And right now, uh, even as we have made clear, we have no hostile intent, we are open to diplomacy, uh, we have not yet received an affirmative response from the DPRK, but that has not stopped us uh, from continuing to coordinate closely uh, with the ROK, uh, with Japan, with other uh, partners and allies in the Indo-Pacific uh, and beyond uh, to um, find ways to promote our objective of uh, the complete denuclearization of the, of the Korean Peninsula. Just on that, are you prepared to talk about the next uh, interactions that there might be between the Secretary and his Japanese and counterparts on that. I'm, I'm not, not at the moment, but I suspect given that, okay. uh, you know, he, he just spoke to... Uh, uh, I know he spoke to the Japanese, and Wendy has been in touch with her people, and Sung Kim has been in touch with her counterparts. That's and, right. There were, there there were conversations by the secretary just But uh, you just would yesterday. expect, would you say that perhaps within the next week that there would be additional discussions? I, I don't know why you would pick that time frame, but mm, that's, it's well, very possible. Next couple of days. Sure. Yes. Also, the U.S. has been releasing joint statements uh, condemning North Korea with uh, five or six countries. Uh, but I wonder why only these, you know, five to six countries. I mean, uh, Japan, for example, which is not a Security Council member, uh, but they joined, uh, but not South Korea. Um, and among Security Council members, India, Mexico, and Norway uh, did not uh, join the statement. So does this mean that you need to rebuild the uh, diplomatic coalition when responding to North Korea? Uh, look, I would leave it to individual countries to um, describe uh, their decision to sign on or not uh, to various uh, uh, multilateral statements that have emanated on the challenge of North Korea. Uh, we know that uh, North Korea's ballistic missile uh, program, its uh, nuclear weapons program, uh, it poses a threat uh, not only to uh, our deployed forces in the region, not only to our regional allies, uh, but beyond that, uh, it poses a threat to uh, international peace and security, and its provocations uh, are uh, broadly destabilizing. And so we know uh, that countries around the world uh, share our concern. We've heard that uh, publicly. Uh, we have also uh, heard that uh, privately as well. I think our approach uh, is uh, distinguished from uh, the previous administration's approach uh, in uh, a number of ways. Uh, I think one of those ways is our uh, focus on working closely uh, with partners and allies. Uh, and so this is work that we began in earnest in uh, the very outset uh, of this administration. I think it's work uh, against which we've made good progress. Uh, but we're continuing to engage uh, day in, day out uh, with allies, uh, with partners, with a broad coalition uh, of countries uh, in an effort to promote our uh, overriding objective, and that's the complete denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. Okay, lastly, um, uh, this question is from my colleagues uh, from VOA Turkish Service. Um, a Ukrainian defense minister said that Turkey and Ukraine will press ahead with a plan to build drones in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Is the Biden administration concerned about the sale and use of Turkish drones in the region? Uh, so what I will say on that is that uh, we know, uh, I think as you alluded to, that President Erdogan uh, is visiting Kyiv uh, and that defense cooperation between a NATO ally like uh, Turkey uh, and Ukraine, we, we think that that bolsters regional stability and Ukraine's ability to defend itself. Uh, as you know, we ourselves have provided unprecedented levels of defensive security assistance uh, to Ukraine. We've authorized our NATO allies to uh, provide U.S. origin equipment uh, to our uh, Ukrainian partners. And we broadly encourage partners and allies uh, to provide security assistance to Ukraine to resist further Russian aggression and to deter a potential Russian invasion. Uh, at the same time, we strongly advocate for the appropriate use of defense equipment in accordance with the laws of armed conflict uh, and in a man manner that avoids civilian harm. Uh, yes? I had a question about the pandemic preparedness. Uh, two years before the pandemic broke out, the State Department released um, there were some cables that suggested that Wuhan Institute of Virology was carrying out some risky research and the security wasn't great. I just wondered to what extent today State Department and embassies around the world continue to monitor for such threats um, and how important you consider the need for such sort of precautions right now? Uh, pandemic preparedness, uh, what we are doing to uh, detect and to prevent um, outbreaks from becoming epidemics, epidemics from becoming pandemics, uh, that is part and parcel uh, of our global uh, health uh, security strategy. 
uh, we know that uh, from experience, whether it's COVID, whether it's Ebola, uh, whether it is the outbreak uh, of any other uh, infectious disease or virus, uh, that the most effective means uh, to combat it is to do so uh, early on, uh, is to do so uh, at the source before it has spread uh, far and wide. Uh, so uh, those efforts are uh, of great importance to us. Uh, the CDC is engaged in it. This Department of State uh, has a role to play uh, as well, as does uh, the Department of Health and Human Services and others. Would you monitor specific labs in foreign countries, perchance they were carrying out risky research? I, I know that we partner. I can say that we partner with a number of countries around the world uh, on, um, uh, on pandemic preparedness, uh, share best practices as appropriate with countries around the world, uh, share practices when it comes to safeguards, when it comes to um, uh, disease detection and surveillance uh, around the world, uh, it's certainly a priority. Andrea. I'm going to ask you about Afghanistan. Uh, there was a briefing this week on the Hill, as you know, and some criticism afterwards. Uh, there is a Senate Republican report that Senator Risch put out, which is broadly critical of the evacuation and the planning. Let me posit that you successfully evacuated 120,000 people after the fall of Kabul which is an extraordinary number. So I'm, I'm putting that out there, okay? But we've since seen uh, the George Packer reporting in the Atlantic, as well as the Axios deputies' uh, notes from an August 14th deputies meeting, deputies meeting at the White House, which is the day, or only hours before Kabul fell that night. So let me ask you about you know, how late the planning was done, because from quotes from that memo, which no one has denied, the planning was just starting to get Afghan translators out, local embassy personnel out, highly vulnerable uh, Afghan civil society leaders, the document reads in part, Embassy Kabul will notify LES, locally employed staff, to begin to register their interest in relocation to the United States and begin to prepare immediately for departure. Well, we know that locally employed staff were not notified when the embassy shut down and the other staff were evacuated. Kabul fell that very night. Was, why wasn't that done sooner as well? Another quote, all departments and agencies will transmit their priority populations to be considered for relocation as P1 slash P2 referrals. That's very early on, at the very last moment. And the question is, with the evacu with the planning, with the, the deadline approaching from the spring on, why wasn't there, you know, despite the COVID outbreak in Kabul Embassy, why wasn't there more planning, outsourcing some of that paperwork for SIVs, P1 and P2s? Why weren't P1 and P2 categories established earlier? Why was it done so close? to when it was impossible to get these others out, many of whom are still there. Okay, so there's uh, a lot in that question. There's uh, a lot in that report that we would uh, take issue with. Uh, let me start by saying that uh, no single document, not gonna speak to the specifics of a purportedly leaked document, but no single document is reflective of the totality uh, of months and months of work and planning on on, 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 on any I'm issue. I'm sorry, but it says begin to query the population of locally employed staff. It doesn't say we've been doing this. It, it, all of these quotes refer to initiating the planning. So that is, it is, that is, is not, highest, that is not an accurate rendition of what happened. Let me, let me, well, it, these are quotes. Let, so no one has denied the let me, legitimacy. Let, let me give you some context as to uh, what did happen. Uh, and in order to do that, uh, you really have to back up to January of last year. Uh, we, as you know, and I think you alluded to. You inherited nothing. We inherited, you said nothing, but yes, it was a program, an SIV program uh, that had been, uh, in many ways, uh, intentionally stark. Uh, it was a program that was basically at a standstill. It was a program that had not conducted a single interview in Kabul uh, since March of the previous year, March of 2020. Uh, after taking office, uh, we surged resources and staff in order to issue nearly 8,400 SIVs in the first year of this administration. 
And since August 30th, since the end of the U.S. military mission, we have brought about 3,500 U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, and SIV holders and their immediate families out of Afghanistan. We are prepared to bring out thousands more uh, this year as operational and security conditions uh, permit in collaboration with our partners. Uh, you also reference this, but of the 124,000 uh, individuals, these were U.S. citizens, uh, these were Afghans, these are other foreign nationals uh, that we successfully uh, evacuated and relocated out of uh, Afghanistan. More than 76,000 thousand Afghans uh, have already arrived in the United States to be resettled. Uh, we, of course, as you heard me say before, continue to work expeditiously uh, to bring more Afghans out uh, and to welcome more of our Afghan allies and their families to their new lives here in the United States. Uh, when the last administration freed thousands of uh, Taliban fighters, undermined the Afghan government, uh, withdrew troops uh, with no plan to, uh, as to what to do next, uh, and dismantled our uh, refugee programs and, and uh, starved, in some ways, this SIV program, I don't recall hearing much criticism of that. Uh, when we took office, as I alluded to, uh, we got to work rebuilding the refugee resettlement program uh, that had been starved of resources to revitalize the SIV program uh, that had gone some 300 days uh, without a single interview in Kabul. And we began contingency planning for a number of scenarios. Uh, it was not by accident, Andrea, that we were able to evacuate these 124,000 individuals from Kabul in the span of a couple weeks in August, including uh, the tens of thousands of Afghans, uh, not to mention our own citizens, lawful permanent residents, and third country uh, nationals. Uh, to give you a broader context beyond this raw number, by mid-August of last year, uh, we had uh, accelerated SIV processing uh, starting early in the Biden administration. Uh, March of 2021, we were doing uh, about 100, uh, uh, we, we were processing about 100 SIVs uh, per week. By August, uh, some uh, six or so months later, it was 1,000, and I think that uh, gives you a flavor of the resources and prior the resources we surged and the priority we attached to it. Do you think that's enough, uh, Andrea? We would always we would always like to do more, uh, but as you know, this is a statutorily defined, meaning defined by Congress, program that has uh, 14 laborious steps, uh, 14 steps that um, are time consuming, uh, and it is a program that was never designed to take place in the context uh, of an evacuation. So of course. Uh, we would like to accelerate that further, uh, but we've always had to operate within the statutorily defined, that is to say, congressionally mandated requirements. Um, second, we pre-positioned military assets that ultimately allowed us to secure and operate Kabul's airport and facilitate these 100,000, 120,000 plus uh, evacuations by August 31st. Uh, we did so under extraordinarily um, challenging circumstances. Uh, third, and this is something uh, where uh, this building uh, took the lead, uh, we swiftly uh, and nimbly built a network of almost two dozen locations around the world that hosted tens of thousands of Afghan guests uh, <laughs> while we ensured uh, that they were appropriately vetted uh, and that they uh, did not and would not pose a threat uh, to American communities before they were resettled uh, in the United States. Uh, in the early summer, before all of this, before the evacuation, we launched uh, Operation Allies Refuge. And we worked with Congress uh, to pass legislation that gave us uh, much needed authorities to quickly uh, relocate our Afghan allies. Uh, so we did uh, all of this. Uh, of the 120,000 uh, individuals. About 10,000 were U.S. citizens, lawful permanent residents, uh, and SIV holders. Uh, in September and August, uh, we built the capacity and have since welcomed uh, the tens of thousands uh, of Afghan refugees uh, to uh, their new homes. None of this happened by accident. None of this would have happened if, as uh, certain documents, certain reports uh, suggest, this all started uh, in August. 
uh, or this all took place in the summer. So uh, why was the memo written that way if they weren't being launched as of I, this I, I can't speak to why one memo of presumably thousands and thousands of documents that this administration uh, produced on Afghanistan in our first uh, seven months in office. It was one uh, memo I, on the day Kabul fell. Uh, it, it's a, a, a deputies meeting at the, at the White House in the sit room. Uh, Andrea, again, I'm, I'm not document. in a position to, to comment on a specific uh, leaked document, but no document uh, can tell the full comprehensive story uh, of what we did, what we were able to do. Uh, and what I've just done is try and give you a flavor of that. There's much more that we can go through uh, to talk about how it was uh, that we were able to evacuate 124,000 individuals, take them uh, to third countries, vet them to ensure uh, that they were appropriate for resettlement here in the United States, bring them to the United States, process them upon landing in the United States, uh, uh, place them on military bases in some cases uh, for final stages of medical screening, work with refugee resettlement agencies, and finally, uh, welcome uh, these new guests, our new neighbors, uh, to uh, their communities here in the United States. Uh, none of this would have happened were this last minute as whether it is a single document or uh, a single report might suggest. Ed, I'm sorry, somewhere the, near, the, near the halfway point of that forest of an answer that you just gave, you said you don't recall much criticism of the previous administration. Really? Uh, Are you serious? I, I am. I am. You don't recall much criticism of the previous administration's policies, foreign policies in general, but specifically on Afghanistan. Ned, my God, you were one of the people who was criticizing the administration. How? Where, where do you get this from? Matt, I'll I'll, I'll make the point that um, this uh, report em fact, emanate, emanated from uh, uh, the minority uh, SFRC. Uh, I'm not sure that we yeah. heard uh, criticism of of that approach during right. the last administration. Oh. This memo came from the NSC, I thought. SFRC. The, uh, the yeah. The Senate report, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, he no, but the memo about. that she's talking about was from, was an NSC. No, the, or, the question was about a, a congressional report. Uh, no, yes. I, I question both. Both, right? Okay, can I ask a completely unrelated question? Okay. The secretary, has he already met with DeMistura, or is that? Uh, it's answer? this afternoon. Okay, well, in terms of Western Sahara, I just want to know, um, I presume that the policy has not changed, everything is the same, but I, would, I, I just want to ask specifically mm -hmm. about the uh, consulate uh, and the, the, the plans that the previous administration uh, had to, to open a consulate in Western Sahara and if those plans are proceeding. Or is that something that is not being talked about with? Deep Matt, we're, we're consulting with the parties on the best way forward. I don't have anything uh, to so add. So is it basically it's still on hold? We are consulting of? with the parties on the best way forward. Yes. Um, <clears throat> just two questions on Lebanon. Senior advisor Hochstein's uh, out in the region. I mean, with so much going on, especially in terms of Ukraine and Russia, for, for him to be out there, um, I mean, it's pretty significant. Is there, I mean, do you guys believe that there's an imminent breakthrough um, in terms of media, uh, reaching a solution to the maritime border between Lebanon and Israel. And um, just a second one on, on Lebanon as well. The top Republicans in the uh, SFRC and in, on the House uh, Foreign Relations Committee sent a letter to Secretary Blinken. I know you don't comment on, on congressional affairs, but um, they're asking him or asking the Biden administration to reconsider support for energy, de energy and electricity deals from, from Egypt and Jordan to Lebanon via Syria due to Caesar Act, uh, potential Caesar Act sanctions. Um, is this something that the, the Secretary is, is willing to reconsider? Uh, so let me start with your first question on the Israel-Lebanon uh, maritime border. Uh, this is a decision for both Israel and Lebanon to make. Uh, we stand ready to facilitate uh, negotiations on the maritime boundary uh, between Israel and Lebanon, and we strongly support efforts to reach a mutually beneficial uh, agreement. You referenced uh, Senior Advisor for Global Energy Security, Amos Hochstein. Uh, he is continuing to work diligently uh, with the two governments, and that does include visits to the region. Uh, as appropriate, we'll uh, update on his uh, travels uh, and, uh, and on his uh, visits. Uh, when it comes to uh, the various uh, energy deals in, in Lebanon, 
Uh, we do welcome regional efforts to help address Lebanon's acute energy crisis uh, and its implications for uh, the stability of the Lebanese state. Uh, the lack of fuel and the lack of power in Lebanon uh, continues to threaten the delivery of critical services uh, like health care, like water, to the Lebanese people. Uh, while we understand uh, the delivery of electricity must uh, necessarily transit uh, the Syrian grid, it's important to underscore our robust sanctions regime against the Assad government uh, remains fully in force. Uh, we have not lifted, we have not waived any Syria-related sanctions uh, in this case uh, or in any other case. Uh, we remain in contact with the governments of Jordan, governments of Lebanon, uh, to gain a fuller understanding of how this arrangement uh, will be structured and financed and to ensure uh, it is in line with U.S. policy uh, and address any uh, potential sanctions concerns. Uh, we do remain in contact with relative go relevant governments in the region uh, to gain this, this more complete understanding. Uh, meanwhile, we're working closely with OFAC, Treasury Department's Office of Foreign Assets Control, uh, to ensure compliance uh, with the U.S. Syria sanctions program. The, the last part of that, you, you mentioned Jordan and, and Lebanon, but you didn't mention <coughs> Egypt. Um, is there a reason? Is that, is the gas deal uh I mean, is there more of a hold up on that we're we're also in contact with the government uh of uh of egypt uh to learn more about the details of this agreement uh yes I'm back thank you i wanted to ask you about india u.s relationship in the context of the tensions that you're having with russia it's a high point has that impacted your ties with india and secondly uh how do you how the u.s sees uh, india as a stand in u.n security council on issue of ukraine uh, I, I will leave it to uh, our Indian um, uh, partners to discuss uh, their uh, their their stance in the UN Security Con in uh, in the UN uh, on this particular issue. I know that uh, we have been in touch with uh, literally dozens and dozens of countries around the world, uh, including uh, our Indian partners, on our concerns uh, regarding uh, Russia's military buildup. It's uh, unprovoked. Um, uh, potential aggression uh, against Ukraine. Uh, these are conversations that we've had at many different levels. Uh, as I was saying in a different context earlier, uh, Russian uh, aggression against Ukraine, a Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, would have implications for uh, the security environment well beyond uh, that neighborhood, uh, whether it is the PRC, whether it is India, uh, whether it is uh, countries around the world, uh, the implications would be uh, far reaching. And I think there's a broad understanding of that. I know the first question. Uh, I'm, what was your first question? Your ties with India, has it been impacted because of the tensions with Russia? Uh, no, we have a relationship with uh, India that uh, stands on its own, that stands on its own merits. Can I ask one more? Uh, of I, you must have seen uh, the Beijing Olympics in which they used a soldier who had, who, who was engaged in uh, um, on the border clash with India. There have been few senators who have raised, raised objections to it. How do you do, see that? Uh, I'm sorry. I, could you re could you repeat that? A Chinese soldier who uh. was engaged in border clashes with India last year, mm -hmm. in recent <laughs> past. Uh, was part of the inaugural ceremony in Beijing's Olympics. When it, when it comes to the broader issue of um, uh, uh, India-China uh, border uh, uh, situation, uh, we uh, continue to support uh, direct dialogue uh, and a peaceful resolution uh, of the border disputes. Uh, we've previously voiced our concerns uh, of Beijing's pattern of ongoing attempts to intimidate uh, its neighbors. Uh, as we always do, we stand with friends, we stand with partners and allies uh, to advance our shared prosperity, uh, security, and values in the Indo-Pacific. Final questions? Um, thank you. Yeah, I wonder you had uh, the Secretary met um, Burmese pro-democracy activists today. Um, could you tell us whether the National Unity Government was involved in that meeting? <coughs> we'll, uh, we'll have a readout uh, for you of uh, that session. Um, we're just not going to be in a position as we... Uh, usually uh, are, are not uh, to detail the identity of these individuals. Uh, many of them uh, are uh, have concerns for uh, their own privacy, potentially for their own security, so we're just not able to go into uh, the, the, the participants. The description of them as pro-democracy activists, does that, is that intended to distinguish them from the shadow government, the national unity government? Uh, these are individuals who have worked in different ways uh, to uh, attempt to place Burma back on the path to a democratic transition. Thank you all.